the most oppressed class of them all, gamers. The only purpose of biological creatures, it is to reproduce. It's so degenerately coomer brained, like you can find purpose in life far beyond just busting nuts. And maybe if you did, you'd actually have custody of your first kid. Uh, and enough, enough, anyways. Enough. Go yeah, ahead. let's leave this case on the side. Do yeah, you he deny wants to move that on. there is... He wants to move on Do because he's deny... changed the story three times and lied it every no. time he changed the story. Seeing how much they're into femboys and they them pussy, I think it's very possible. Yeah, well, they'll pay the price. My guy, you can just well, say you want a uh... sip of the titty milk. Gariepi said that he could deliver a child at home and raise it because of his experience working with monkeys in research labs. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Naomi, Naomi. Uh -huh. um, if we could... I'd like to keep the the ad homs out of it if we can. Bit of a fun moment being able to kiss my fiance before going on to debate my existence as a mother. I've got a pretty spicy opening statement, so <laughs> we are bringing the heat. What up? My name is Nominal Naomi, or you can call me by my nickname, the N word. Uh, I'm a PhD student and I study computer science. Uh, amongst other things, I have a platform here on Twitch and YouTube where I talk about queer rights. And if you're interested, you can check me out. Just Google Nominal Naomi. You will find all my links. Would love to have you in the Nom Nom community. I'm JF Garyapi. I'm a biologist and you can find me, find all of my social media links at jfg.world. I host JFG tonight every night. Naomi's opening statements. You have seven minutes on the clock. Go ahead when you're ready. Motherhood is so much more than a biological function. To argue that motherhood is solely based in biology, which my opponent must do in order to deny my motherhood, is to deny the motherhood of adoptive mothers, of stepmothers, of foster mothers, of so many mothers just because they don't fit into the most typical mold of motherhood. But they know that they're mothers, and their kids know that they're mothers. In every functional, social, and legal way, they are mothers. And quite frankly, it would be silly to refer to them otherwise for the sake of everyone involved, and especially the children. I know that I'm a mother, and my kids know that I'm their mother. Motherhood is knowing that my kiddos aren't entirely sure if my name is Numi or Mom. Motherhood is when my four-year-old daughter saw me kiss her other mom and say, that's love, entirely unprompted. Motherhood is the first moment she ever called me mom, a slip of the tongue that happened on Mother's Day before we even told her that I was going to be her mom, a moment that I will never forget. Motherhood is watching her excitedly and unpromptedly tell everybody she meets, I have two moms. Motherhood is wiping literal shit off of my three-year-old son's foot, which neither of us know how that happened and still cleaning it up anyways. Motherhood is witnessing my nine-month-old trying to say ma 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 as she excitedly bounces standing on my lap right after I fed her. Motherhood is the sudden and intense realization that you are responsible for preserving the life of a little human. Motherhood is being scared of raising your kids wrong, and yet constantly learning how to love and support them better. Motherhood is navigating respectful co-parenting with their dad, informing and including him on all the decisions pertaining to the kids, even though I'm intensely upset with the way he's treated my fiancé throughout their marriage. Motherhood is the so difficult, entirely thankless, but incredibly rewarding job that I do for my kids. Now I tell you, it's going to be rich hearing Mr. Garayepi argue against my motherhood, when he personally has a long-standing history of being an unfit partner and parent, spanning three divorces, multiple court trials, and a long string of his exes publicly accusing him of emotional abuse and filing sexual assault charges against him. And hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, Naomi, Naomi. Uh -huh. um, if we could, I'd like to keep the the ad homs out of it. If we can, um, if it's if it's pertinent to the debate, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll let you go ahead with your with the rest of your opening. But just so you know, if you open that door. You know, he's going to be free to respond the same way, so... I mean, I, I'm I guessing it will be pertinent, but we can hold it off until until things go that way, if you'd like. It's up, it's up, I mean, it's up, I'm just saying, um, you know, you might, might want to steer clear of that. Just, just to be clear, I was not intending of doing personal attacks today. I brought my pictures of the terapsids. I wanted to talk about the biology of lactation. Yeah, let's do that Fantastic. instead. Okay. That would be... That's, that's, that's a lot better. This is not a safe space. Now to just like fully poison the well, the part that I was going to read in the intro, which Andrew cut off, which, by the way, <laughs> the reason why Gariepi does not want to play the ad hominem game is because the ad hominem f destroys him. And it's also very relevant to the case of parenthood. Uh, so he had a child custody battle with his third ex-wife where the state of North Carolina's trial and appellate courts awarded sole custody to the child's mother without visitation from Garyepi, whom they believed entirely lacked the ability to provide a safe and healthy environment for a child due to a court-ordered psych evaluation of Garyepi, 
which deemed to be suffering from distorted thinking and, I quote, overt psychosis. As one example, Gariepi said that he could deliver a child at home and raise it because of his experience working with monkeys in research labs. And it gets worse. During that custody battle with his third ex-wife, Gariepi, who was 31 years old at the time, convinced a severely developmentally disabled 19-year-old fan of his, who he met online, to travel halfway across the country and move in with him so he could impregnate her. After just three weeks of them living together, at a point where Gariepi was falsely claiming that the girl was pregnant, the girl's parents, whom she had lived with exclusively prior to Gariepi, who was her first ever romantic partner, these parents filed for a temporary restraining order and eventually legal guardianship on behalf of the girl, and they won in the conservative courts of Texas, of all places. As part of that legal battle for guardianship, which by the way was completely uncontested by the girl, she did not contest her parents arguing for, for guardianship to, to save her from that situation. She underwent two court-ordered psyche vows. The first one deemed her incapacitated and entirely incapable of taking care of herself, let alone a child. And the second psych eval deemed her to possess the social and mental maturity of a 10 or 11 year old child. She has no comprehension of cause and effect relationships and is often known to have impaired decision making. That was a direct quote from the, from the psychologist. The reason why he has to make parenthood and everything all about biology is because all he's ever going to be is a sperm donor. I'm a mother, I'm a parent, and he's just a sperm donor. But go, anyway, go have the rest of your opening. It's clear that Gariepi is planning on, on gatekeeping motherhood based on biology, uh, given that that's the only relationship which he has with the child that he lost custody of. And if we look at all available scientific and medical literature on translactation, it is shown to be safe and healthy. And that's exactly why I am working with a doctor as part of the lactation process of feeding my child. And I'm going to do everything I can to be the best mother I can for my kids. With that, I see my time. So I'd like to bring us uh, 300 million years into the past when terapsids, descendants of some kind of amphibian-like, reptilian-like uh, creature, eventually started sweating from the breast, sweating, sweating, releasing humidity. And eventually that humidity turned out to somehow help its babies. We think that the first terapsid who was sweating over the eggs that he was pounding, uh, helped the terapsid keep the eggs moist because those eggs were not like the chicken eggs with a strong shell. They were, uh, they were like parchment paper. They were very flimsy. They were easy to destroy under dry conditions. And by sweating, the terapsid would have basically invented lactation. Uh, we are not so far from this situation where today we are convening with a descendant of the Terapsids who has decided to retake this evolutionary step, this massive evolutionary job of creating milk from sweat. <clears throat> the Terapsids eventually led to animals like the platypus. The platypus eventually led to animals like the mammals that we know which gave the main feature of the, the mammals that we today know and how they got their name, mammals, the idea of having tits, the idea of sweating a very advantageous liquid into the mouth of your children. Uh, today we'll be going over the evidence that Naomi brings uh, very often forward to make the case that this this liquid that comes out of male breast after they have gone through the trans woman process of hormonal changes is uh, safe. And I think it is safe. Safe in the same sense that Shanika letting her child lick the sides of the trash so he can get a little bit of that Cheetos powder is safe. It's kind of ridiculous. We can kind of feel that it's not a good idea, but it's not criminal and the child is probably not going to die. So the liquid that comes out of male breasts, once you treat the male with hormones that imitate the hormones that a female would have, uh, is a liquid that will have just like any biological liquid. There's an unwritten law of uh, biology which is that if you suck on a biological tissue enough, 
you'll get some white liquid coming from it. And there's going to be fat in it, there's going to be sugar in it, and there's going to be proteins in it. That is what's happening with the males who are, uh, who are breastfeeding as females, as trans women. Uh, and the unwritten law of biology states that if you don't get that white liquid, you're just not sucking strong enough. Now, the question to me is not so much whether that thing contains sugar, fat, and proteins. Of course, it will, like any piece of your body. We could give you ground, ground Andrew Wilson. We could ground the whole body of Andrew, and there would be some level of nutrition in the, the paste that comes out of it. To me, the question is, is there solid the evidence the that the lactation, the, the lactating males of today that are reported in the literature are producing a milk that shares s serious similarities with those that have, with those uh, members of the human species that have evolved to produce a milk. And first, the first step for this is to understand the complexity of milk. So of course, I'm not surprised that we get induced lactation in a transgender woman. I'm not surprised that there's all sorts of documentation out there medical documentation that portrays to trans people that they can do it, that, oh, you, you may not get the volume, but you may supplement with formula. And, and But what I don't like is the context of deception that we raise trans people in and the context of deception in which they are getting their medical counseling. Because basically what we're telling to trans people is it doesn't matter if we don't understand the full complexity of milk, you're going to figure it out, you're going to make it, and we're telling them because it, it's making them feel better. Uh, of course, we tell them also side solutions. So the first reality that I would like people to realize, and especially trans people who are getting into the whole lactation thing, is that you're probably going to need those side wires that are connecting your breast to a bottle of formula. Basically, you can deceive yourself into thinking that for a moment you are breastfeeding, but the reality is I don't know of a single trans person who has succeeded at, a single trans woman who has succeeded at feeding for the whole period of the full feeding of breast over a year or two with their breast milk. The volume is systematically too low, too little, and needs to be supplemented, which is why we tell trans people, just connect a little wire like this. It's going to give you the impression that you're breastfeeding, but what's really happening is your baby is getting feed, fed by formula. <clears throat> now, the atmosphere of deception I'm talking about is not limited to the question of lactation. It's overarching over the whole trans lifestyle. We have Matt Walsh coming up with reporting five hours ago, just before the show. Uh, they have tricked a trans healthcare provider to write a letter for, uh, for their producer, basically showing how easy it is to get your balls chopped in America. And the big problem of the medical system on this is you have the doctor saying, oh, we're not doing it quickly. We're asking for a letter of a professional who truly knows the person. But as it turns out, these professionals will tell you that they are automatically giving that letter, that if you say a couple of key words, they're just going to give you that letter. And so we have a fake process of verification. And within, within a few days, you can get from, I'm talking to someone on a Skype call, this person writes a letter for me, and now my doctor believes that I have gender dysphoria. That is what a Matt Walsh producer has succeeded to do. Now, I have no issue with the personal lifestyle of Naomi as far as it goes for Naomi. I'm not trying to change Naomi. I don't want Naomi to, to change the, the lifestyle that they have chosen. So be it. Uh, you know, when people choose that lifestyle, which is non-reproductive, where you will often end up raising the kids of someone else, where you are basically being the cuckold in terms of your parental care, uh, taken, where your parental you care has been account. taken over by someone else who produced the actual sperm leading to the baby, so be it. It's going to go away with evolution because across all generations, there is always less people 
willing to care for children that aren't theirs versus children that are theirs. And Drew, are you telling me I'm headed toward the end? You're right, right there, man. Okay. I gotta wrap it up. Well, I have much else to say, but I guess we're gonna get through it in the debate. What I will simply say is milk from a breastfeeding woman contains millions of live cells, thousands of proteins, amino acids, 200 complex sugars, 40 enzymes that make the digestion easier, growth factors, hormones, vitamins and minerals, antibodies, and importantly, 1,400 different types of microRNAs. This has been acquired by mammals over 300 million years of evolution. You're not going to get the same thing from formula, and you're not going to get the same thing from a quick intervention with three, four hormones and a chopping of the bowels. You're not going to get there in a few years of work on a male. You simply cannot produce all of these things. You're going to tell me that the juice that gets out of a, a male tit will have some of these, some sugar, some fat, some protein, anything that comes out of your body has these things. But you're not going to make me believe that there is solid research indicating the full constitution of the milk has been reproduced in males. I don't believe it. Yeah, I think it's really interesting how, just like I said, you would go to invalidate the motherhood of anybody who does not do this as a biological experience by calling me basically a cuckold. Um, you're doing the exact same thing to every adoptive parent out there, and I think that's quite disgusting because of all of the profound ways that adoptive parents sacrifice for their kids and, and do everything they can for their kids. Well, on adoptive parents, I will say this. It's okay that it exists, uh, as long as there are children who are left alone and who are in the need of care from an adoptive parent, uh, it's fine. It, it's better than leaving the child to die in the forest. But it shouldn't be uh, mistaken for uh, something that is evolutionarily advantageous and something that will be maintained across evolutionary times. Uh, it can absolutely be ad ad like adopti evolutionarily advantageous for adoption. Especially if there are kids that need to be taken care of, and there might be like gay couples within a population that can take care of those kids. I mean, we observe that in the animal kingdom. It seems very much evolutionarily advantageous, especially for like gay parents to adopt kids. That way, you get well, no, be them being the parents, parents and kids aren't being taken care of. Passing their genes. Hang on, the gay hang parents on. aren't passing their genes, so it cannot be evolutionarily advantageous. What you have is basically the capacity to care of the gay parent may be there. Uh, it, it may be used by the baby, but the well, baby is carrying the I'm, genes of another couple. That's not what I'm arguing. I'm not saying that it's evolutionarily advantageous because gay people are passing down their genes. I'm saying it's evolutionarily advantageous because you have these kids that they now have parents, and so more members of the human species are able to survive. And if you really care that much about genes, those kids can then go on to pass down the genes. Well, uh, the human species does not qualify as an evolutionary entity. Uh, the fight is always for who will populate the earth within the human species. And when if, a couple the of human gay species people is not, help... If the human species is not an evolutionary species, then why are you like caring so much about what's evolutionarily advantageous? The human species is not a subject of the theory of evolution. The subject of the theory of evolution is the natural selection of genes. And there is two things possible in the future. Either there are more gay genes or there are less gay genes. That is the only question that is an evolutionary valid question in terms of the natural selection of homosexuality or trans lifestyles. And as long as uh, the homosexuals and the trans cannot make as many babies as the conservative families and the heteronormative family, then they are bound to reduce in number, reduce in size until they disappear. Personally, I just like don't care how many gay genes or trans genes there are out there. And that's also presupposing that like being gay or being trans is, is rooted solely in biology, that like sociological influence, environment upbringing has no effect on whether or not people are gay or trans. But just by the fact that we've seen like much higher rates of people being able to identify as gay based off of the level of social acceptance of gay people, shows that this can't all just be strictly biological. And so you're basing this off of a, like a, a wrong presupposition 
And also just like, I, I don't care about like whether or not the percentage of quote unquote gay genes that get passed down, like that doesn't really matter to me. Well, your, your presupposition about my claimed presupposition is incorrect. I don't claim that it has to be purely biological. Even if there was a social influence, there would still be genes that make you uh, able to record that social influence or able to resist it. So no matter whether a social influence is involved, I state something that, that remains true at the genetic level, whether it, it is directly caused by genes or caused by genes that listen to the environment. Okay. Now, you may not care, but there are serious societal, there are current societal consequences to you not caring about the evolutionary stability of the systems of family that you propose and that you uh, are a part of. Uh, for example, uh, as we evolve to be good parents, we evolve to care for a genetic similarity in our children. And of course, we are less likely to be good parents to a child that is not ours. We Why have is evidence that? here. Why is that? Because evolution works that way. Evolution. Wait, you just uh, said that's what, it's just you, you said it's, it works that way because it works that way. That's like an entirely circular argument. But I mean, I care I more about the well-being of kids than just like exactly. passing down the genes. And so if you care about the well-being of kids, you should care about the fact that minority stress, substance use, and intimate partner violence among sexual minority women, a series of different studies indicate that there is more violence, more partner violence, sorry for this one, more partner violence in same-sex couples and it leads to domestic abuse situations that, of course, the children are more likely to suffer from. So same-sex partners are associated with higher Wait, rates of domestic hold abuse. Hold up, hold up. You're talking about domestic abuse, like, to the, to the women or, like, to the partners? Like, that's not, to the partners. that's not the claim that there's extra abuse to the children, because all available studies we have on, like, trans parenthood and gay parenthood show that the kids turn out just as fine and developmentally appropriate? Uh, this is not the conclusion of this study. In 2009, uh, child maltreatment, elevated risk of child maltreatment in families with step parents, but not That's with not adoptive parents. That's not about gay people or trans people. My claim was about gay and trans people. And the risk of like, uh, the risk of harms in like adoptive and step families has a lot more to do with broken homes than like being a step parent or an adoptive parent. You'll find that in like step parents and adoptive parents that love and care for their kids that have the resources they need, that that's not the case. So you're, it, that, the I'm reason sure. why we see that trend is because it's pre-selecting for already more broken homes. But I had made a claim about gay and trans parents, not step and adoptive parents across the board. And what I'm telling you And I can you cite like a Williams Institute adopt... report, for example, that was a, a summary of all available research on the subject, which found that, yes, trans parents are just as capable as cis parents as raising kids, and it does not negatively impact their development at all. When you engage in trans parenting and homosexual parenting, it is inevitable that one of the parents will be a step parent, will not be a biological parent of the child. And therefore, right, but how is you, that are elevating, you are elevating the risk of having families where child maltreatment Wait, are, dude, is you're more literally likely doing to the happen. Wait, you're literally doing the correlation equals causation thing. So as I explained, there's a correlation between step parents and um, abusive maltreatment situations in the home, but that's because step parents are more likely to exist within a, a, a broken home in the first place. So that's not a and causative effect. It's, wait, 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 it's not a causative effect. Homes also. It's not a causative effect that there's more abuse in like step parent homes. It's a correlative effect, and there you're, is you're not proving abuse. causation here. There is more abuse in homosexual se homosexual uh, families. Same sex That's against IPV the partners, in the not National the Violence Against Women Survey. So That's you're going to tell me partners, that these lesbians, these lesbians are hitting each other in a way that totally does not impact the child. So also my question to you is, is, is that intimate abuse more likely to result from within the relationship? Or is it more likely to result from like predatory men outside the relationship? Oh, so now it's the fault of men outside the lesbian relationship if the lesbians are hitting each other. No, that's Explain not what I said at all. That works. What, I, what I said is that when we look at like elevated abuse in minority women, like that first study that you cited, we often find that the overwhelming majority of this elevated abuse 
comes from men who are abusing minority women rather than it being intimate partner violence? Well, this one is intimate partner violence, IPV, in the National Violence Against Women Survey. Uh -huh. uh, among same-sex couples, largely ignored by policymakers, blah, blah, blah. As such, the present study is a secondary data analysis and represents the first multiple variable regression analysis of U.S. adult same-sex IPV prevalence using a nationally representative sample. Logistic regression indicates that independent of sex, respondents with a history of same-sex relationships are more likely to experience verbal, controlling, physical, and sexual IPV. Intra, uh, Can you read the last line? Wait, the last violence. line's really important. Can you please read that last line? <coughs> respondents with a history of same-sex relationships. No, no, no. The, the line after likely... behaviorally bisexual respondents experience the highest IPV rates and are most likely to be victimized by an opposite sex partner. The study you're citing literally says they're most likely to be victimized by men. Because they're bisexual. Of course, they will be more likely to be to be uh, victimized by males. Well, the lesbians even lesbians don't have a male in the Even home. lesbians are more likely to be victimized by men because that's Bisexual, the most common that's case. Not lesbian. No, no, I'm I'm saying in general, even lesbians are more likely to be victimized by men because men predate on women without knowing that if they're a lesbian or bisexual or straight. I mean, you're you're trying to do a whataboutism on other forms of violence. I'm telling you that this mode of family is associated with higher domestic abuse and uh, increases the risk for situations where the children suffer. I think the, the studies make their point very clearly. So all available evidence that we have on trans and gay parents shows that this does not negatively impact their ability to raise a kid in any way. And if, if that's the case, and, and we truly care about the kid, then just talking about the IPV, which is suffered by the parents, which is more often the case due to predatory men, as the study you cited claimed, that, that shows that you're, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're, you're focusing on the IPV rather than the well-being of the child, which the studies show the children turn out just, just as fine, if not better. Let me ask you something, Naomi. Do you think it is a good home environment to raise a child in a home where there is inter-partner violence? Generally, no. There's also a difference between active intimate partner violence and past intimate partner violence, because the study which you cited was dealing with past intimate partner violence. And so just because somebody had intimate partner violence in the past does not mean that they're a current victim of intimate partner violence. And so trying to conflate those two things is very dishonest. And that's the problem in the question that you're asking me. More likely to experience IPV. Right, that was, a, that was a survey about their past experiences with IPV. It, it, you could do a survey about your current relationship and ask if they are currently in an intimate partner violence situation, but the survey didn't so ask that. So you claim that it gets better. Well, I'm guessing that if they're in a happy, healthy relationship such that they're having children, it's probably going to get much better. Was that survey done uh, on like people that had kids or was it just relationships in general? Because the relationships well, that have kids are different than the relationships that don't. All right, well, I mean, I've laid out what I had to lay out. Uh, there are increased risks in these families. Now, will these risks play out all the time? Probably not. Can it get better? Well, I would need some data to convince me that it can get better, but I'm certainly not going to assume that it gets better. And so in general, I've made my point on this. And Naomi, if you have anything to add, or we can move to something else. Well, sure. If the problem is that we're saying that current intimate partner violence is bad for raising kids, then I would generally agree with that. And it's a good thing that my relationship with my fiance does not contain any intimate partner violence and is not a concern amongst my relationship and amongst my relationship with my kids. Trying to say that like, you know, gay relationships are, are less good because of intimate partner violence. Why don't we just condemn the intimate partner violence and not the gay relationship? Because the gay relationship is shown to be just as good at raising kids. So if the intimate partner violence is the problem, then yeah, intimate partner violence is the problem and we can condemn that. But that's not my case and that's not my situation. Now, I take issue uh, with uh, the lactation aspect. I want to present here um, some of the results that we already know comparing breastfeeding to formula. No doubt you can raise a child on formula only. They're going to get what we call the macronutrients okay. And in fact, the formulas are so advanced, the, the, the modern recipes of formula are so advanced that you're going to get even some of the electrolytes uh, and 
some of the calcium OK and DHA and all these additives that they put in formula. Formula has gotten better over the last hundred years, but still we get just in comparison of formula to, to female breastfeeding, uh, an increased ear infections, increase in diarrhea, increase in respiratory infections. That's affecting those people who are raised on uh, formula, increased meningitis, increased allergies, diabetes, asthma, obesity, sudden infant death syndrome. That is the state of knowledge on something that we've worked on formula for basically a hundred years. I take issue Yippee! with a bunch of experimentalists who are saying, let us try, uh, let, let us try to have a male or someone who used to be a male and who tried to transition toward female produce this liquid. Uh, we don't know about the contents of this liquid other than the basic nutrients, the sugar, fat, protein. We don't know if it even compares with formula in terms of contents of microRNA, uh, contents of hormones, content of all sorts of signaling pathways that are happening genetically between the genes of the mother and the genes of the child and that have evolved over millions of years. All we have basically is a liquid right now coming out of male breast or, or, or breasts that have developed as male and then were interrupted through artificial hormonal, hormonal manipulation. And we don't have anything that would allow us to consider that it's a good nutrient. It's okay. probably, it's probably so, okay. You're probably you'll... not going to have something in your body that will kill your child, you but it's probably not picture? very good also. And given that so there wait, are already- you, got, you said a lot already. Can you, can you give me a chance yeah, to respond? Go ahead. Yeah, so go ahead. I, I don't dispute this, I, this notion that breast is best when it comes to micronutrients for a child. Uh, although I will say that having a fed child is a lot better than having a dead child. And for all the mothers out there that need to use formula or supplement with formula, that they should continue to do so because a fed kid is best. Uh, but if, if you truly believe that the, macro, that the micronutrients of breast milk are what's best for a kid, that's exactly what I'm providing for my kid with my breast milk. Um, we have done analysis of at least the macronutrients of a trans woman's breast milk, and it found that it was just as good as reference levels, if not better. So if we're, you know, acknowledging that we're in a world where fed babies is better than dead babies, where formula exists, and in cases where, for example, like the biological mother is unable to lactate, uh, you know, my fiance, for example, she works 12 hour shifts at the ICU at a hospital. So she cannot routinely pump and breastfeed our child. So me being able to supplement something, which at least has the available macronutrients, and that there exists no evidence that it wouldn't have, that it wouldn't possess all of the micronutrients that we would desire it to. I mean, like trans women's breasts through HRT, through the female puberty, which HRT induces in trans women, they develop to be biologically identical to cis female breasts. We've done research studies that have literally looked at the breast tissue of trans women under a microscope, and it was found to be no different than the breast tissue of cis women. So I, I guess like under what biological mechanism would my breast milk be different from a cis woman's? Like, like what's your evidence that my breasts are so fundamentally different structurally functionally in a cis woman's that the milk would, would not have the same micronutrients. Uh, I, I deny that these histological studies show the exact same thing. I, I think they show some similarities in the development. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a study basically. for you right here. It says short term and long term histologic effects. Hey, hang on, hang on, Naomi. Uh, the, the thing is, I know, I know your up. study. I've seen all mm -hmm. of your studies. I've read your stuff. I've listened to your stream. I know your, your arguments. The study that you're about to quote calls it pseudolactation to describe the histological uh, tissue in, in trans women's breasts. There's a reason they say pseudo, and it's because it's pseudo. It is, it is an imitation. It is a convergence. We make it biologically looking like that of a female, but those are not completed female breasts. In fact, the breasts of a young woman who has never given birth are not fully developed. Even her breasts are not capable of producing the same quality of milk as a woman who has 
given birth. And so, no, I, I certainly don't believe that a male will accomplish the same level of nutrition. And in fact, it's not about the macronutrients. My whole point is that milk is not just a nutrient. It's not just a donut, uh, breast milk. Breast milk is a signaling system between a mother and a child. It coordinates hormonal pathways. It coordinates growth factors. It gives them growth factors that help their brain grow. Uh, it, it has long chain fatty acids that play a super critical roles in the establishment of the nervous system. And all of this has evolved to be delivered through the tit of the female. And there is no sign that the male is capable of packing as much quality, as much antibodies, as much of everything the baby needs. Uh, and so it would be crazy to start with the assumption that they can. What the study means by pseudo-lactational is that it's pregnancy-like as in it's imitating pregnancy. And the research study, which I have, short and long-term histologic effects of castration and estrogen treatment on breast tissue in 14 male to female transsexuals in comparison with two chemically castrated men, literally says that combined progestative antiandrogens and estrogens are necessary for genetically male breast tissue to mimic the natural histology of the female breast. And what they found is that the, the actual female breast tissue changes which occurred in the trans women who were taking estrogen and progesterone did not occur in just chemically castrated men because this actually induces these same biological pathways which happen during female puberty to create that breast development. And, and I, I, I see that JF is, seems to be worried about some kind of nutrient in, in my child, but you know my child has a regular pediatrician. I'm seeing a doctor over this lactation and there, there are no concerns that my doctor or the child's pediatrician has about the development of my child, about the nutrition of my child. E everything that we're doing is for the best sake of my child. And JF is just going, essentially, he's just going to play the game of like, there's not enough evidence when he doesn't have any evidence which disproves the nutrients of my breast milk. He doesn't have any evidence that my breast milk is unsafe. All, all he's trying to do is play the, like, we don't know game, but that's exactly why I'm working with a doctor, so we can know more, and so that we can do this safely and healthily, and so that I can supplement the formula diet that my child is currently on, because I care about the nutrition of my child, I care about the health of my child, and everything that I'm doing is for that purpose. Uh, a doctor is not useful to determine what we don't know. Take the argument you just made, for example, and apply it to Brando. I don't know if people would know what Brando is. It's this drink in uh, Idiocracy that everyone drinks because it has electrolytes. There's no evidence that a child cannot be brought up on, on Brando only. There's no evidence that Brando hurts a child. There's no evidence that having Brando will kill the child. And the fact is, we don't know. We don't have evidence because we haven't gone through, but it would be insane to assume that Brendo has the micro RNAs necessary for a child to get everything that he would get from bre breast milk. This uh, analogy is kind of ridiculous because, okay, also first off, doctors are good at finding things that we don't know. Doctors are the ones who like publish research studies to figure out things that we don't know. But trying to compare my breast milk to Brando is pretty crazy because we have a body of evidence and a body of literature on lactation in trans women, yet we don't have any evidence or literature on kids being fed Brando. And you're not going to find a single doctor who is going to recommend that you breastfeed your kid with Brando. Yet my doctor and numerous other doctors who are following the WPATH standards of care recognize that trans women breastfeeding is absolutely something that you can do to feed a kid. And if there's concerns about volume, you can always supplement with formula, just as many cis, cis mothers do. Exactly. And so we end up having basically a bunch of doctors who are participating to a collective deception, which is that this breastfeeding is happening in any major way, when in fact these kids are basically licking the last drop of formula they can get and perhaps they're getting something like sugar or fat from this milk, but there is absolutely no evidence that this milk delivers what the normal woman milk Wait, delivers. Are... This whole histological study that you cited earlier only looks at slices of breast and say, oh, they look the same. 
they, they mimic, they mimic the same, they look pseudo same. Uh, this is not an analysis of what gets delivered to the child. Right. That was a different study. The one uh, that actually analyzed the macronutritional contents of a trans woman's breast milk. I can go ahead and pull up that study as well. So this was the study that actually analyzed the macronutritional contents of a trans woman's breast milk. And the conclusion says that it provides reassurance about the adequacy of nutrition from human milk produced by non-gestational transgender female and non-binary parents on estrogen-based gender-affirming hormone therapy and supports the importance of this experience on a personal level. So do you have access to the whole article? Yes, I do. I do have access to the whole article. They actually had a table of like the, the macronutrients in the trans women's breast milk, and it was all above reference levels. And, and macronutrients, can you give a list of what they are? Does that include yeah, let me go ahead. Does that include microRNAs? So you're describing micronutrients right there, not macronutrients. So, so just so we get an idea of what is embedded in the parenthesis of macronutrients? So macronutrients like would be know. things like proteins, fats, lactose, uh, sugars. So basically, those kind of things are the macronutrients. From a donut. You'd get this from a donut, you realize? Yeah, but they're not in the right levels from a donut, but they are in the right levels in a trans woman's breast milk. So just like I they're in the right levels donut, in a cis woman's breast milk. If I put a donut in a mixer and I dilute it at just the right amount, I get basically what's been demonstrated for trans woman milk. No, they wouldn't have the right nutrient levels. I, I have all of the macronutrients. I have fat, I have protein, I have sugar. And you don't have so, so what actually makes up the breast milk. That's the difference. And what is it? Breast milk from a trans woman. Do you, do you like what? Do you want to run some tests on my breast milk? Like, so, so you're, you're, me you're a biologist. I, I, can, I can give I you a sample. I call it milk. But I would call it donut milk, and it would be it would be equal to what this study proves about your milk. That's still not going to have the same levels of nutrients, and it's also going to have all of the other wrong micronutrients in the donut milk. But all available evidence of the trans woman's breast milk shows that it is safe and healthy and appropriate. All of the children that have come out of the case studies of trans women breastfeeding have turned out to be developmentally appropriate and healthy. If they were feeding this kid donut milk, I sincerely doubt that that would happen. But that didn't happen in all the trans cases. Like, it's very clearly I, a different substance. Honestly, I don't think a kid will die from donut milk. We'd have to try it. But, but I, I don't have any evidence that it would be judged as dangerous. It's probably do, going to do exactly what please, formula please find... does, which is you're going to end up with diabetes and obesity and all sorts of problems, hold up, but in hold a up, statistical hold up. manner. Saying that you're going to end up with these problems is very different than noting that there is a correlation here. And also, like, you're not going to find a medical doctor that's going to advise you on feeding kids donut milk. Yet the medical standards of care, which have been set forth by the WPATH, actually have standards of care for trans women lactating. Yeah, so what you're telling me is based on absolutely no different evidence advantaging trans woman milk over donut milk, you're still going to have the medical apparatus side with you and say the trans woman milk is safe. And they're not going to say that the donut milk is safe. The reason why you see a difference is because literally all available evidence points to trans women's breast milk being safe and healthy. But there is no available medical evidence which would suggest that donut milk is healthy. Like, the amount of evidence we have to back these up is the difference. And if it were the case that there was something unsafe in my milk, then my doctor would warn me about that and tell me either not to breastfeed or to take, like, get it taken care of. Like, for example, if I was on a medication which is dangerous to pass into breast milk, like, my doctor would not advise me to breastfeed while on that medication. And I would listen to my doctor and follow their advice. But they're not doing that the because they don't have any concerns about the nutrition provided by my breast milk because all available evidence shows that it is sufficient, healthy, and I mean you're you're going to keep on appealing to this well we don't know we we don't know about the micronutrients like under under what under what evidence or what mechanism I, that's what I'm more curious like under what mechanism would a trans woman's breast milk differ from a cis woman's breast milk like what's the mechanism that makes those two different Okay, and I can theorize, right? I, I, I just want to lay out examples that could be totally true. Uh, we don't know everything about the functioning of the hormonal communication between the mother and the child, but something totally plausible. The woman has a cycle 
which leads her to sleep at the right time. And she has an evolutionary interest at sleeping at the same time as her baby. She delivers into her baby's milk a set of hormones that synchronize the sleep cycle of the baby with the mother. And it leads to a more healthy growth for the brain because the baby uh, is timed right when he can get the milk, when he can sleep, and when he coordinates his sleep with his mother, it leads to a better development. If so wait, under what case, mechanism can I not do that? Uh, well, because your breasts have not evolved to deliver this hormone. But they have. German. Because I've taken estrogen progesterone, they literally have evolved in that way. That's what all the available evidence no. shows. No, because your, your male ancestors haven't been subjected to this evolutionary pressure that leads to this But delivery. my female ancestors so have, so I, I would have those genes in me too. Like, I get half my DNA from my mom. You're going to make all of these speculations as to some kind of mysterious biological mechanism, a hormone syncing between baby and parent, to try to claim that, like, my breast milk is going to be sufficiently different that it's not a good idea to feed a child. Uh, when, like, this this speculative mechanism which you're inferring literally could include me under all of the biological mechanisms by which we know how trans women's breasts develop, by the ways in which we know that I have DNA, which is half from my mom and half from my dad. Like, if we're just going to play the speculation game, I also speculate that that mechanism would include me. Uh, it's not a speculation how breast milk can impact the quality of your baby's sleep and yours. Right, it does for mine as well. Uh, it is... <laughs> <laughs> you don't know this. You are speculating. We know that regular breast milk works to do this. Right. So, so my wh point, why wouldn't mine? My, you are playing with nature without knowledge of what will happen from it. Is it dramatic? Is it criminal? Maybe not. And maybe a Soros DA wouldn't be moved by this as being a case of neglect and wouldn't pursue it. But the fact is you are, you are leading, you are deceptive toward the audience when you tell them it's okay, when you tell them we have the studies, when these studies are extremely limited on extremely limited samples, and they certainly don't cover all of the functions that could and that do exist in breast milk, just those functions that we know exist, let alone those that we don't know and don't understand. When you bring up this article about how breast milk affects sleep, like, what is the mechanism by which it affects sleep? We need to know that mechanism to know whether or not it's going to affect me the same way. I'm looking at the article right now, and it says that it has to deal with prolactin and oxytocin, which is going to impact the mother's sleep. And I'm literally taking medicine to give me the prolactin levels that are associated with lactation in cis women. And also, like, I release oxytocin in the same way that a cis woman does when I lactate. So... I have all of the mechanisms which this article you cited is talking about. So to suggest that it wouldn't include uh, me, that's ridiculous because it's based on mechanisms which I possess. Any good doctor knows that taking something from a pill or artificially injecting it is not the same as having your body produce it. Well, that's why uh, I know, take bioidentical hormones because they are the same. Even if the hormone is the same, the way you inject it is not the way your body expects it. I'll give you one example, nicotine. Nicotine exists in our brain. It, it, uh, I mean, there's acetylcholine in our brain and it triggers the nicotinic receptors. Uh, it triggers them and makes us want and be motivated to certain things. Now suddenly take an artificial triggering of these receptors by an exogenous injection and the same thing doesn't happen. Uh, we, we become addicted, we become dependent to that source and our, our brain doesn't work in the same way when it responds to the outside molecule because the scheduling of these molecules with respect to how nature produces it and where nature produces it is extremely different. So, so no, I will not I'm not talking about nicotine, that... I'm talking about bioidentical hormones. Well, uh, the, the fact that they are bioidentical doesn't change. Uh, your body is not used to have these hormones delivered by pill through the stomach and, and by a schedule of once a day or twice a I mean, day. I it's gotten That's pretty used to it over, over the past like couple of years. Like I've been doing this for years. My body is pretty used to that at this point. Your body is used to it, but your genes aren't because your genes come from millions of years of evolution. And that's, now how they ex that's not how they expected oxytocin to be delivered. Well, they've certainly gotten used to it. So 
I don't see I don't see how that <laughs> caused an issue. It causes an issue because when you play with nature like this, you play you you have unintended consequences, which every doctor will tell you that the ideal is to is if nature can handle it and that medication always comes with side effects with unexpected outcomes and with eventually habituation so i i don't know of doctors that would tell you that doing everything the natural way is most ideal i mean that's literally just the appeal to nature logical fallacy but like if a medicine truly benefits someone they should take that medicine and even when it comes to like breastfeeding and medicine doctors will recommend that you stay on your medicines that you're able to stay on while breastfeeding and only if a medicine is noted to have adverse effects while breastfeeding should you go off that medicine and Pretty all of the medicines that i'm taking health. are noted as being safe for breastfeeding so like there's no issue with my medicines and the breast milk that i'm producing there's a difference between being noted as safe for breastfeeding and not having any cause onto the children uh, we don't know long term what will happen with these children. They will have basically been exposed I mean, we to have... microdoses of various medications that we've never tried on children. We have so long term studies. We really studies. don't know what's going to happen with we, this. We actually have long term studies on the breast milk of women who have used literally every medication that I'm taking, and there have been no adverse events noted in the development of children. Like we have these yeah. long term studies. You, you can look at like the the lactation and medicines journal in the National Library the of Medicine. Problem with this is uh, not everything is an adverse event noted in a study. There are lots of things like what happens to these children in terms of diabetes that may not pass the statistical threshold of detection, but that may still exist. There's their IQ, their development, their creativity. None of this will be measured in those studies. If that's so the concern that you're trust... appealing to, then no cis woman should breastfeed. Like we, we don't have that kind of data on like any kind of breast milk. We have better than data. We have evolution. We have the fact that our ancestors have survived with uh, cis women breastfeeding their children. My children are surviving too. So boom, na nature approves. And we'll see in a thousand years from now if there are still people like you who breastfeed the children of other while being XY chromosome. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty much by I the next generation, transphobia is going to die out. Like, once once the older, more bigoted generation dies, like, this younger generation is incredibly trans positive. Like, we're going to see trans rights win across the board just once the bigotry dies out. Well, chase nature and it will come back galloping. I can't wait to see what happens. How so? How's it going to come back galloping? Uh, there is a reason why the default state of humanity has converged toward religions that reject non-reproductive lifestyles, that reject lifestyles that do not lead to the creation of babies. I've got three kids. I think I'm good. And also being you, trans, you can still like they don't even carry have biological any of kids. your genes. Okay, they don't carry cares? any of your genes. And you have admitted at the beginning of this show that you didn't care. I don't care and if they carry my genes or not. eventually replaced by people who care. I don't see any evidence that I'm going to be replaced by people that care about genes. And you don't have to see the evidence. It's going to happen whether you see it or not. How is it going to happen? What's the evidence that it's going to happen? Mathematical calculations around genetics, natural selection, and the facts of the physical world. What are those mathematical calculations? That anyone who doesn't produce baby doesn't have their genes represented in the next generation. Therefore, the sum of their phenotypic expression and all behaviors and everything that they are is less likely to reoccur in the future, while those people who do make babies are more likely to have their phenotype reoccur in the future. Okay, but like, who gives a shit? Also, most trans kids are born to cis parents, so it seems that even if, like, most parents who reproduce biologically are cis, we still get trans kids. You don't have to give a shit for natural selection to give a shit about you. But like trans people are still going to occur because trans people are born to cis parents all the time. That's where most trans people come from is cis parents. But Even if like parents... all the trans people die out and don't reproduce genetically, cis parents are still going to have trans kids. These cis parents who give birth to non-reproductive children, do you think that in three generations down the line, their genes are more or less represented in the generation that comes? Well, if they're not reproducing, then those genes would be less represented overall. But that doesn't mean that trans so people aren't going to exist. Natural selection doesn't just apply to you and what you care. It applies to the entire line of descent. Well, wait, just because some parents, trans people don't reproduce doesn't mean that trans people are no longer going to exist. Like, that doesn't follow at all.
uh, it doesn't follow. That's like, not trans how trans people works. have been and around. That's not what I said, either. trans people have been around as long as human history has existed. Like we can look at anthropological records of that. trans people spanning back thousands of years across all of human evolution and development. Yeah, but y humans have been existing, have been separating from the ape branch seven million years ago. We have no idea that the trans lifestyle is existing 5 million years ago, 1 million years ago, even 200,000 years ago. I mean, there are we like transgender behaviors that are observed in animals. This seems to be a naturally occurring thing. Uh, you may see transgender behavior in animals. It may be a completely separate process from the one that we see emerging in our society right now. Sure, but I guess like it just goes to show that transgender existence seems to be repopulated across animal species beyond just humans and so it also makes sense that like trans people would still exist even in human species because that's that's like our entire history of ele evolutionary development as a species has shown that trans people existed for as long as we know and they're going to continue to exist even uh, within societies we that were know. much more hostile my, to trans people we, we still don't existed. know for very long we, we don't know for very long uh, oh, okay might so now that, you're saying we uh, don't know the evolutionary future when you just said that we had like math <coughs> mathematical models no. that are going to show that transness is going to be like wiped out or whatever no i'm talking about the past here you don't know whether there were trans people a million years ago don't you we have like anthropological records from the earliest of human societies we have no insight into most of our evolutionary history to assume that there were half chimpanzee half human trans is completely insane. I don't know, you don't know, no one knows, probably not. But like we observe transgender behaviors in animals. It seems a pretty safe assumption to assume that like even like earlier pre-human ancestors would probably also exhibit those behaviors which we see in animals. Like and we see transgender behaviors doing... in like lions and monkeys. Yeah. And then the problem is common. what is trans behavior by this definition? Because you can stretch that definition to capture so many things that it has nothing to do with the with the phenomena as observed in human societies. So yeah, I know that for like uh, lions, male... there was like cases of like uh, trans lions that would like sprout manes and then like actually live socially within the role of like a male lion. Okay, well, would he end up having a chance at making biological babies? Maybe, I don't know. Would he chop, would he chop his testicles? Because that's what we're talking about. Well, we're talking about, about a current... lion that was assigned female at birth. Because they transition into being like um like taking on the social role of a male, so they wouldn't the have lion testicles. Was the sign but also oh, like lions lion. have lions have gay sex. Even if like a, a male lion thought that this this transsexual lion was like a male and then had gay sex with a lion, like they could produce a kid that way. Because like lions have gay sex too. I'm confused. I, I'm really just trying to understand. The lion is born as a female with right. a vagina. Uh huh. Okay. And then, like, grows a mane uh, and takes on the social role of a male. Okay. And did they have a shot at eventually reproducing? I would guess yes. I, I would believe guess so, they yeah. Wouldn't. They wouldn't have a, a how, how do they call it, the, the false penis. Uh, the, the kind I'm not, of I'm not aware make. of trans lions growing penises, no. Just, I'm okay. just aware of them, like, growing manes so and taking on the social role of males. And also lions just, having... Lions being pretty bisexual in their in their behavior, so I, I think they could reproduce, yeah. Okay, so this is totally different from an evolutionary perspective. It may be a misfiring of behavior. It may actually even favor the the chances of reproduction if supporting the role of a taking the role of a male for a while may have been beneficial to that lion. But certainly the lion isn't sterilized. And my point is the modern trends are, have been led down a path of self-sterilization. You're mischaracterizing like trans people as a whole. Most trans people don't get bottom surgery. Like most trans people are capable of fertility. And even for like trans people that have been on hormones for a very long time, like we, we have fertility treatments that can make these trans people fertile again, especially if we use technology like in vitro fertilization. So like trans people can still reproduce. And hey, maybe, maybe if we end up in a future where like having, having a trans partner is what's really in. Then maybe trans people will even be selected to reproduce more. You know, if everybody is going like crazy for they, them pussy, then maybe those, those non-binary people are going to be better at reproducing. I will not deny the maybe in, in a, in a world it could happen, but I, I highly doubt this will happen. Again and again, sexual selection has With led With the younger to... generation, seeing how much they're into femboys and they, them pussy, I think it's very possible.
Yeah, well, they'll pay the price. They they haven't paid the evolutionary price yet, but they'll find out that they them pussy is highly unreproductive. Why is it highly unreproductive? Because it's a, it's basically a cylinder of flesh created by a doctor that doesn't have the purpose of reproduction. Well, most they them pussy comes from AFAB people who are non-binary. Like most they them pussy is reproductive. Maybe it is in principle, but I don't see much big families coming from these couples, and I have no doubt that they make less babies on average than the cis hetero family. I guess, I guess we'll we'll have to see when once we once we see the younger generation and and how hip and cool they are with the transgenders. JF, I'll start with you. Go ahead. Yeah, I was about to actually say my thoughts on this. Uh, ultimately, here we have Naomi telling us we'll see. We'll see. Perhaps there will be evolutionary cost. Perhaps there will be evolutionary advantage. And I actually don't take so much issue with people uh, living a, an alternative lifestyle and taking paying the paying for the risk that they take, uh, because there is a lot of risk along the way. There is a lot of sterilization happening, even if it's not happening to everyone. And even those who don't get sterilized, they still live. Uh, lifestyles that are less reproductive. So what I'm most worried about is the deceptive cultural system that is emerging around the trans theme. It's not so much that I want to object to the liberty of Naomi of living their lifestyle. I'm actually fine with it as long as Naomi pays the evolutionary price of what she does. Now, the problem is we are misdirecting a lot of people. Uh, society had become dependent on a set of social signals that was favoring heteronormativity. And that was good for people. It was leading them down a lifestyle that where they would be more happy, where they would derive the happiness that we know is greater, the happiness of having biological children of their own and the well-ordered natural system that emerges from people raising children in which they are truly invested genetically. With all this elementary school rainbow kind of stuff that we see in Canada, in the US, in Europe, we have a system of propaganda that is developing not only to deceive trans people into the kind of deceptive bubble that they want to exist, that they have demanded to exist in, that they have demanded to be protected from contrary opinions to their own, for example, through forced, uh, you know, misgendering policies and, and stopping people from calling people a woman if they think she's a woman and a man if they think she's a man. Uh, we have ultimately a force of social pressure that will mislead a lot of people who otherwise would have had very healthy lifestyles. They may have doubted for a moment, oh, maybe I'm a girl, maybe I'm a boy, but they wouldn't have been led down that path. They would have subscribed to the heterosexual lifestyle, which by any measure, whether you measure suicide, depression, mental health correlates, is a better lifestyle. I mean, if the trans lifestyle and the LGBT activist lifestyle was a cigarette, we would have to put a label on that cigarette that would indicate its increased risk for so many mental disorders and so many disorders like I've listed around domestic abuse. So Hold why up. when you're talking about like the warning label on an LGBT lifestyle, you're making the, the same mistake you did earlier where you're assuming that correlation equals causation and you're also falling for all of the, the misinterpretations of the data which we talked about earlier, like selecting for past intimate partner violence, like not recording current intimate partner violence versus past intimate partner violence a and just like this is a correlative observation not a causative one there, there's no evidence to suggest that being gay or being trans causes the negative impacts that these people face what is shown to be more causative of these negative impacts is is societal marginalization and ostracization we have studies which show that compared to before versus after, if we socially affirm a trans person, for example, they have much better mental health outcomes. <clears throat> really, like the, the, the things that, that trans people need to be supported is access to loving, healthy, supportive environments and access to the medical care which they may need. Uh, you, you were talking about a lot of this, a lot of this cultural argumentation hinged, hinged on the notion that trans people are somehow deceiving people. 
uh, or that were like living in some kind of like lie or deception, but you never demonstrated that point. There is nothing denying reality in a trans person self-identifying a certain way or in a trans person, you know, talking to a doctor to induce real medical changes in their body, which they are aware of. There's, there's no lie in their existence as a trans person, in them understanding themselves as a trans person. There, there's no lie there. What is, what and is, what is, as far as just is, like, have you, seen this, Naomi? you know, the, the reproductive nature of society, I mean, trans people can and, and do reproduce. And I think that as society becomes more accepting and welcoming, which the next generation absolutely is, we're going to see more trans people who are able to be parents. Really, the, the barriers which trans people face deal from social stigma this, and, and marginalization. So as these barriers are lifted, more trans people can be able to reproduce. And even in the world we live in right now, most trans people don't undergo surgical sterilization. And if they do, they, they're often able to like bank fertility before even undergoing surgical sterilization. So if, if it's like the genes that you care about so much, I mean, trans people can just like access a sperm bank and they'll have access to those genes if that's something that, that they care about as much as you do. What so I, I guess like I'm really interested in kind of hinging on that point where you say that this is all like a cultural deception. Like, what is the lie that the trans person is, is living in by existing and, and declaring themselves like a trans person? Well, do you agree that there has been a cultural push, for example, to keep people from expressing their view about whether someone is a male or a female? For example, do you acknowledge that in Canada, it might be illegal at this point for me to refer to you as a male? It would not be illegal in Canada for you to refer to me as a male. Because but you're just you lying about what Bill C-16 been... did. This is the same lie that Jordan Peterson told. Uh, there has been zero people in Canada who have been arrested solely on the basis of misgendering. Now, what yeah. Bill C-16 actually does make illegal is hate speech. And, and, and it codifies, like, transphobic hate speech as hang a form on, of hang hate hang speech. On, hang on, Naomi. Let's have a little back and forth here. You, you ask me about the deception. The source of the deception is that we have a social pressure, a, a social pressure of punishment, and it can be punishment like banning from social media or threats of the law or threat of unclear law. I don't know right now if I could call you a male in, and if the, the Canadian government wouldn't knock on my door tomorrow morning. That is a problem. It's a pressure mm -hmm. and it leads to a deception. Zero people have deception. been arrested for that. Well, also, I don't see how that makes any sense at all. A father in Canada has been found guilty of child abuse, essentially, and deprived of child contact for misgendering child. I know that case. Child. Yeah, you're, you're lying about well, that case. You know that case. So what actually well, happened is that father violated court orders, which were telling him not to dox his kid and the kid's medical doctors. He was found in violation of the court orders for doxing his kid and doxing his kid's doctors. Well, where did Naomi this all stem from that there was a court case in the first place? It was that the, do the, the father wanted to call their daughter, daughter, and their, their, their son, no. son. He wanted but to that's tell not his why the view court case about stemmed. the gender of their child. That's not why Anyways, the court, wait, wait, no, no. The, the reason really why that court matter. case stemmed out was because this father was trying to block his kid, who he didn't even have custody for, by the way. He was trying to block his kid from accessing medical treatment, which the kid's psychiatrist deemed to be medically necessary. And that's why the court case was initiated, and he was arrested for violating court orders, not for misgendering his kid. Like, people that and, make these claims about the story are just lying about what happened, because Bill C-16 doesn't make misgendering illegal. The treatment that we're talking about is nothing else than gender-affirming treatment. So this father couldn't tell his view about the sex of no, their child. No, he can, he can say his view. He can't dox his kid, and he can't make medical decisions it was on behalf of the kid, which the he court. does not have custody for. That's why he committed a crime, because he was trying to override the, the doctors and the parent who actually had custody of this kid when he can't do that legally. Trying, it's, not for, it's not about misgendering. It is. It is ultimately, because he was trying to affirm the real sex of this child. If was all he did was child. say, I still believe my child is biologically the gender they were born as, he would not have been arrested and that would not have been a crime. Was but that's to not what he this. did. He and did was far beyond that, abuse. which was criminal. And, uh, enough, enough, anyways, enough. Don't yeah, let's leave this case on the side. Do yeah, you he deny wants to move that on. Is... He wants to move on do because he's changed the story three times and lied at every no. time he changed the story. 
do you deny well, that there is a pressure against misgendering in our society, whether it be through corporate pressure, through governmental pressure, or the law, or anything? I mean, I would say it's more about just, like, asking for respect. Like, is there, like, a cultural pressure against bullying? Like, there, there, if there's, like, cultural pressure or a general societal notion that, hey, bad behavior should be discouraged, I think that's actually a good thing. And, like, misgendering people is a bad thing. It's shown to be very profoundly negative for the mental health and well-being of trans people. And cis people, too. Cis go. people hate being misgendered. You, you have you have uh, you have laid out your moral framework over the deception. That deception is good. You but think. it's not a deception. That, How is it a deception? It's a deception because you're being deprived of the opinion of someone else about what your sex is. You can have your opinion. You're being deprived you're, of I'm not an the, objective wait, I'm not observer. depriving you of your opinion in any way. Like you can have no, your opinion. No, you're not depriving me. So you're depriving deception. yourself. You are depriving yourself of feedback. From an uh, from an objective observer that would tell you you are a male. Well, objectively, I'm a transsexual. Like I have taken steps to alter some of my biological sex characteristics. I acknowledge that I was born biologically male, and I acknowledge that the medicine which I'm taking alters some of those biological sex characteristics. I'm not deceived by my biology at all. Like that's just wrong. I I am aware of my biology. I'm aware of all the you, sex characteristics I was born with, and I'm aware of the ones that have changed. You're not listening. You are deceiving yourself from the objective feedback from other people. Your argument would literally be equivalent to saying that, like, by saying that bullying is bad, you are depriving people of the objective feedback that bullies have about, like, your appearance. Like, that argument's just completely ridiculous. I mean, I'm aware that you can, you can like, you can call me male if you want. That doesn't change my biological reality that I was born biologically male, but then I became a transsexual and this has changed in my biology. You have to act delusional biology to ignore all of the biological changes which have occurred because of the hormones that I take. I don't ignore them. They are there. That doesn't change uh, your function in society, which is that you are born as a sperm provider. You will either succeed at providing sperm as part of a reproductive act, or you will fail. Look, my function that in society goes, goes far beyond busting a nut, but if that's all that you view your function in society as, then I guess that, that's what you were to your first kid. That's the only purpose of biological creatures. It is to reproduce. And it we is are to so reproduce much more than well just biology. Well like, we are, we are children. societies. We are humans. We do so much more than just bust nuts. Guys, we are at the limit of our time, actually, for the debate. All right. Well, it certainly will not take me seven minutes. I've said what I had to say tonight. Uh, Naomi in final says that depriving ourselves of the bullies uh, input on our life is a form of self-deception. Uh, it is not because the bully doesn't come out with a truth. The bully doesn't, doesn't come to remind us of a truth about the world that we want to hide from ourselves. This truth is that the process of transition, the process of gender transition, is merely a, a superficial, look-based, appearance-based thing that, that can be applied. And I'm actually not against it being applied to people who truly feel discomfortable with their gender. But it will never make you the other sex. It will lead you down a path of a lifestyle that, that has extremely bad correlates on the side of mental health, suicide. And if you can, if you can decide to continue life as your own sex, as the sex you're born with, uh, that would be highly recommendable. That's all I'll say. And as far as Naomi uh, contribution to the cultural discussion, we need to minimize it to the point where it doesn't recruit new people into a lifestyle that we know is damaging for the individual. And I wouldn't object to Naomi living the way uh, Naomi wants to live, but I would certainly object to children and people who are influenceable to be exposed to the propaganda that everything is okay and the propaganda that ultimately hides the dark aspects of the trans lifestyle. Yeah, so with regards to kind of like the, the quote-unquote damaging lifestyle which you're talking about, the damages which trans people face are damages which result from social ostracization and social marginalization. This is what all available peer-reviewed literature 
on the topic shows is true about trans people that when you are when they are socially supported and affirmed in their identities their mental health outcomes turn out just as good as cis people so if it's truly you know damage to individuals uh that you're cared about then you would be a warrior on the side of trans rights a warrior against transphobia because transphobic attacks harassment social ostracization, otherization of trans people, these are the things that cause damage to trans people. And so if you truly care about reducing that damage, then you would want to normalize trans existence and, and you would want to create a better social environment for trans people. I mean, we saw this exact same thing with gay people, where gay people used to suffer much worse outcomes with mental health, with their life, but it's because people just hated them for being gay. As societies become more and more accepting, gay people are now able to live happier, healthier lives. And there's still some work to be done there, but if you truly cared about reducing harm and helping these people, then you would want to improve society and, you know, combat homophobia and transphobia. I, I, I never understand the point about denying reality or denying biology or trying to create like a deceptive culture because I don't deny my biology in any way, and, and trans people at large don't deny our biology in any way. The fact that we take hormones to medically transition shows that we are starkly aware of the biology that we're born with, but we just desire to change it. And so by acknowledging that, you know, I was born biologically male, and then I transitioned such to become a transsexual female such that some of my biology's changed, that's me acknowledging reality and recognizing that how I go moving through society, being perceived and treated by people my in my everyday life, everybody just assumes that I'm a woman and treats me as a woman. That is just a descriptive statement of reality. I'm, I'm not denying reality in any way. Trans existence is not deny reality in any way. And then for you to suggest that the sole human purpose is to produce babies is, is just, it's so degenerately coomer brained. Like you can find purpose in life far beyond just busting nuts. And maybe if you did, you'd actually have custody of your first kid. And with that, I see my time. Uh, first question I have is towards Naomi. Uh, Naomi, you've been accused, and this is all over Twitter. I'm sure that this is no news to you, of essentially doing this for the purpose of attention. There's tons of alternatives which are available uh, to children to breastfeed them or, or you know, breastfeeding alternatives uh, and this type of thing. Uh, why is it that you're on the forefront here uh, if it's not for attention? Is there is, is that the, the primary motive is to bring attention to this? You know, and kind of starting out, my primary motive was just to share a moment of queer joy and show that like, hey, trans people can be parents. We can have these loving relationships with kids and that we can, you know, really do anything that, that a cis parent could. And I actually did not expect the moment to go viral at all. It, it was it was picked up by the transphobic side of Twitter very quickly. And with the amount of hate and harassment that was thrown my way since it was Clown World first found my post, I, I decided that, you know, I was going to do everything I can just to clap back against the hate and try to push out for broader education and awareness of the topic. And so, yeah, it just started as a moment of, like, normalizing queer joy and then turned into a moment where I'm now defending myself from... The likes of Tim Pool fans, Matt Walsh fans, and all of transphobic Twitter. Do you think it's a good idea for us to be very cautious about uh, feeding this to babies until we know more about it? Uh, similar to how we know breastfeeding does work and kind of these formula alternatives, which I think many people don't like the formula alternative and would concede probably, hey, it's better for a child to, to eat something. You know what I mean? But obviously it's mm -hmm. it's not necessary for them to eat male secretion. That's not necessary yeah, yet I, anyway. So do you think that, would you recommend still that people you utilize these alternatives until there's more data that's available? Well, on I think it? that concern is absolutely warranted. And, and that's why I would encourage any trans woman, I mean, any, any cis woman, any woman in general who wants to breastfeed their kid to talk to a doctor about it, about, you know, the medications they're on, about getting any tests done if they need to. And so, yeah, having having a healthy concern for the well-being of kids, I think is a great approach. And, and that's exactly what I did by going to my doctor, by going to the kid's pediatrician uh, and keeping everybody informed on the on on the issue. So a healthy amount of concern, I think, is, is the right thing here. 
Okay. Well, I don't have a specific question about titty milking, but there is a question in relation to a um, the evolutionary paradigm. Uh, evolution has many ebbs and flows. So how do you know that this push in this direction, you know, um, is not the right direction in terms of evolution? Because evolution does not provide a stable framework. My guy, you can just well, say you want a uh, sip of the titty milk. <laughs> no, thank you, my dear. Um, although I'm sure you're a nice person. <laughs> Naomi, um, I had uh, several things. I'll try to get to them quickly. Um, you, you were discussing earlier about how ostracization was uh, a very effective tool at uh, making trans people um, the corollaries of negative side effects uh, of being trans. Right? Mm -hmm. You were saying it was it was because of ostracization. Okay, I was wondering if you if you maybe felt that uh, applying that same ostracization to normal people would give the same side effects. Yeah, absolutely. If there was like say a society where like people with blue eyes, for example, were ostracized to the same extent that trans people are in this society, I think you would absolutely observe similar effects in the mental health of people that have blue eyes. And it'd be very dependent on, you know, whether or not they're affirmed and supported in their social environment. We've seen this all throughout various societies where if there is a particular type of bigotry against the type of person that you, you observe a very severe adverse effects on that group of people. So for instance, if uh, white, heterosexual males in the United States currently are being ostracized from polite society, being removed from their bank accounts, hypothetically, of course, as it isn't actually happening, um, that would be seen as terrible, and the people responsible for it would be seen as bullies. Well, that's a pretty big if, but if, if there was a society that, that truly oppressed the most oppressed class of them all, gamers, for example, yes, I think you would observe that same trend. And those people that were responsible for it should be held responsible. It should be a reprehensible social act against them to ostracize them back for, for initializing that ostracism against very natural and normal things, right? Once again, very big if, but yeah, I mean, like, I, I would I would absolutely be upset with the gamer folks, for example. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, uh, you also said that... Uh, uh, so from my understanding, and I don't have later numbers, but in 2016, only 0.6% of the population identified as trans transgender. And in 2017, uh, that was 3% of the population or a 500% increase in a matter of 12 months. I wondered, uh, where do you think that came from? Now, now you said earlier that mm -hmm. you said most transgenders come from uh, normal people's wombs, right? Like just regular heterosexual, heterosexual couples. Um, how do you explain this rocket in the increase in transgender people? Yeah, well, it's the same reason why in kind of like the early 1900s, only about 3% of the population was left-handed. But then by the mid 1900s, it skyrocketed to about 12% of the population that identified as left-handed. When you have a, a, a group of people that is allowed to exist as they are, uh, because of the, you know, gradual removal of social monstrosization with a gradual societal understanding of this type of people existing and, and kids actually being allowed to exist that way, yeah, you're going to see more and more people that are able to safely come out uh, with the identities which they probably always held, even if they didn't have the language to express that. And I think that with the internet in particular, we're seeing a much, a much more rapid growth where, you know, with the kind of like left-handed people, um, it took a little bit longer for that effect to fully, to fully observe out, but with the modern day internet, we can kind of spread this information a lot faster. I think that this is allowing more of the younger generation to be able to actually identify that they're trans if they are. Okay, so I guess just apples for apples on the gotta, analogy. Gotta, gotta make sure you wrap it up there, Richie. Roger. Uh, apples for apples on the analogy, if only 12% after it became socially acceptable would become left-handed, um, I think JF would be correct in assuming that the transgenders aren't going to win this war of attrition in, in uh, creating progeny. It's never been my goal for trans people to be the most represented type of per person in a society. I just hope that we, we come up with a society that treats minorities well, be they trans or gamers, whatever. Or the majority of the population. But thank you. Thank you for your time. $4 comes in from Jim Bob. He asked Naomi, does your man juice alter its composition for sick babies? No, it doesn't. Therefore, you don't have sufficient mechanisms to replace an actual breast. 
I believe it does, and I, I don't see any evidence that it wouldn't. I mean, it's always the same thing, this this whole, I don't see evidence. Well, if there was evidence, you would want it to be hidden from you. When there is evidence, you you claim that it doesn't exist. When someone else wants to bring evidence to you, you make their speech illegal, or at least you ban them from social media. You're never going to see ev the evidence that you claim not to see because you don't want to see it. But I mean, I'm happy to uh, see no evidence. One makes, uh, again, we are, we are faced with the Brando case. Everything that you say when you say there's no evidence of can be said about Brando. I mean, I'm happy to see evidence, and, and you've cited evidence here, which I've looked at and, and even pointed out where you were misusing and abusing your evidence. So I think it's just the case that reality has a left-wing bias. Okay. Uh, moving over to the Dono chats again, Raven Crow says, Naomi, don't you think it's selfish and exploitative of you to post pictures of yourself feeding your child on social media, knowing it'll upset a lot of people? Haven't you already had police reports filed against you? CPS reports, etc. So there was somebody that like tried to dox me and file a police report, but uh, as far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to post a picture of you with your kid on social media. And I blurred up my kid's face in order to protect their identity, so I don't see anything wrong with that. And yeah, I'm I'm allowed to post myself being happy, even if it triggers people that are bigoted against me. All right, and that's it for us. A couple things that I want to mention. Trying to characterize JF as a libertarian is pretty is pretty crazy because like he advocates for white ethnostates, by the way. White ethnostate or neo-Nazi who also tried to impregnate somebody who was mentally a child while he was fighting it for a custody battle of a kid that he lost definitively. There's a real pattern here about alt-right neo-Nazi white ethnostaters that can't find people who actually like and appreciate them for who they are, so they abuse people who are mentally underage. There was also this crazy quote in the Psyche Val that said, Although Gara Yepi does now think that she is incapacitated, should she found to be so, then he wants to be her guardian as her quote-unquote domestic partner and future husband. Like, he, he wanted to get the, the legal guardianship of this girl so he could impregnate her. Like, his lore is insanely bad. Yeah, overall, I think that went very well, very well.